All right. Now, as I mentioned in prior earlier, we're wrapping up our, our, our three-week series on the family. Of course, we already discussed, you know, the wife's role in the family, the husband's role in the family, and um, now we're gonna now we're gonna be going into the children's role. Okay, and there's there's not if you didn't think that there was a whole lot of commandments for the, for the husbands and wives, there's even less for the children. The children's role is very easy, and we're gonna sum it up right here in verse number one of chapter six. The Bible says, "Children, obey your parents in the Lord." For this is right. The number one thing as a child that you need to do in your role in the family is obey your parents. You have to listen to what they say and do what they tell you to do and have respect unto your parents. Your parents know what's right for you. Your parents know what's good for you. Your parents know what is best for you. And the children need to listen and just obey. You need to be able to hear the words that the, the, the laws and the rules that are made up from your parents and you need to hear what they have to say and just obey it. You don't always understand why. There's a question a lot of parents hear, I'm sure, all the time. Well, why? Why not? Why can't I do that? Why, why, why? You always want to know why. And nothing wrong with asking the question why. That's a fair question to ask. But the bottom line is you don't have to understand why, child, you just have to obey what your parents have to say. This is what, what the Bible says. Now, in, um, in Romans 13 elsewhere, the Bible explains that there's powers that are that be. Okay, and we kind of went over this with the, with the husbands and with the wives. That um, ultimately, especially with the wives, because the wives are supposed to be submissive and obedient to their husbands. Well, the only time that it's justified really to not be obedient to your husband is when it's contradictory to what God says, because God has the ultimate supreme authority over all of us, over every one of us. So yes, the husband, yes, the dad has authority in the household. Yes, the children need to obey their parents. The wife ought to obey their husband. But God is the ultimate authority. So if anything, any commands, anything that, that the husband or the father or the parent says in their role of authority, if it contradicts what God says, that is when it's okay to, to, to disregard the commandment or, or, or to be able to, to supersede the authority of, of the parent or the husband or wife. That is the only case. That's why I said, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Okay? For this is right. And um, verse 2 says, Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. And we mentioned earlier, I did an entire sermon on honoring your father and mother. We'll get to that a little bit in this sermon. But the commandment of promise is that, is that it may be well with thee and that you might have long days upon the earth. So if you want to live and have a really good, long life on this earth, learn to honor your father and mother. Learn to respect them. Learn to obey them and do what they have for you to do. And that commandment comes with a promise. You receive a promise by obeying that commandment. It's a good promise. It says in verse 3 that it may be well with thee and thou, thou mayest live long on the earth. That's the promise that you get. And it says in verse 4, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So I'm going to do a little bit, of, spend a little bit of time on the children's side. If you're a child and, and what you ought to be doing, you know, in, it's mainly obeying your parents is pretty much the, the main focus of the role. But I'm also going to be um, going a little bit into adult children, right? Because adult children still have parents. And it's a little bit different because you're not directly under their authority necessarily. You know, if you're out, you have your own family, you do not fall under any longer that authority structure where they are in charge and they're the ones that are your bosses telling you what to do after you go out and start your own family. You are no longer under that authority structure. Yet, being a, being a child of theirs, does not you're not just done with your responsibility in the family. So we're going to go as a youth, as an adult, and then also for teaching and training your children as parents. So this, this, the, the family aspect regarding the children, I'm also going to be dealing with properly raising your children because it, it all ties together. Um, the, the Bible says here in verse 4, it says, You fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. So here's one aspect, one element of, of for a parent, specifically for a father, when you're raising your children, it says, don't provoke your children to wrath. 
That means, I mean, provoking means you know their buttons. Don't push those buttons. Don't, don't provoke your child and instigate your, your child unto wrath just to make them angry. Just for whatever purpose, just, just provoking them, just to make them wrathful and angry. It says, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So it's not always just about, you know, um, the discipline. We're going to get the discipline in a little bit. But um, it says, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You don't want your children just getting angry and then getting bitter and despising you and despising your authority because of the way that you're raising your children. And it's giving us admonition specifically to the fathers because I think the fathers are probably a lot more likely to have this type of thing happen. The, the mothers tend to be a lot more nurturing, a lot more caring, a lot more empathetic and sympathetic to the children. The fathers, they're in their role as the leader and they want to see things done a certain way. And, and fathers typically tend to be a little bit more strict on the rules, a little bit more right down the line because there's just the difference between men and women. And the Bible saying, hey, look, fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. So there's a way with dealing with your children that, look, I'm all for, you know, having rules set up and having the children follow the rules and keeping them in subjection as they ought to be, as the Bible says, that they need to be in subjection unto, unto your rule and unto your authority. But you don't want to make it so that your kids are just, just always angry with you and you're provoking them unto wrath with the things that you have them do or, or whatever it is, the way that you're, you're bringing them up. You need to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And then Colossians 3 verse 20 basically is a repeat of Ephesians 6.1. It says, Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. The Bible says that when you as a child obey your parents, that pleases God. That makes God happy. God is happy with you when you listen and when you obey what mom and dad tell you to do. God looks down on that and that makes him happy which is a great thing. Remember that when, when mom and dad tell you to do something, when you listen to them and you obey, God will be happy with you. And again, in verse 21, though, here it says, fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. And that's the other thing. You don't, you don't want your children just giving up. You don't want them being discouraged and just feel like they're beaten down and just, and just you know, their spirits are discouraged. They're brought down because you're being so strict and just not letting, not being merciful at all, not being long-suffering. God, as a, as a perfect father, has a lot of attributes. Now, God is a God of justice. God is a God that, that says, hey, look, you, know, you reap what you sow. You've done this wrong. Yeah, you're going to pay for it. God is definitely a God of that, but God is also a God of mercy and of long-suffering and patience and kindness. And we need to remember that as fathers so that we're not just provoking our children unto anger and unto wrath. Now, sometimes your children might get angry and sometimes they might, they might have that kind of a problem. Now, it doesn't mean never let your children get angry. But you're not supposed to be provoking and instigating them purposely trying to get them angry just to get them angry. Because that's just going to discourage them. And, um, you know, we need to bring them up in nurture and admission of the Lord. We'll get in a little bit more into the parenting a little bit. Go, if you would, please, to Proverbs. We're going to spend quite a bit of time in Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 1. This is still now, I'm still kind of focusing mainly on, on being a youth, being a child, growing up, and, and what the child's role is in the family, and the things that you ought to be doing as a child, and the things that will help children. And this applies for all ages where you're still living at home with your parents, your parents are your authority over you. I don't care if you're two, if you're three, if you're four, if you're 14, 15, 16, I don't care if you're 20, you're living at home and you're under your parents' rule. You need to be listening to this. You need to hear the instruction. Look at Proverbs 1, verse number 8. The Bible says, My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. For they shall be an ornament of grace under thy head, and chains about thy neck, my son. If sinners entice thee, consent thou not. So the first part of verse 8 is saying, hear the instruction, or your father has instruction for you. Your father is going to tell you good things and things that, the way that you ought to go. You need to hear that and receive the instruction that your father has. And it doesn't forsake not the law of your mother. The laws that your mother lays down, the things that you're supposed to do, the things that she tells you not to do, don't forsake that law. Listen to them because there will be an ornament of grace under the head and chains about thy neck. 
He says, my son, if sinners entice thee, can set that out children. You might come into people, into contact with people that, that don't go to church. They're not godly people. They're going to be a bad influence on you. And a lot of times people are going to try to entice you. That word entice means that they're going to try to, they're going to, try to get you to do something. And, and they're going to, enticing is like, um, they're going to try to appeal to you in a way where um, it might sound good or it might look good. But really they're going to try to get you to do evil. They're going to try to get you to do bad things. And they might bribe you by saying, oh, hey, look, come and be my friend. We'll go play with my toys, but then we're, we're going to go, you know, smash somebody's window or do something bad. That would be evil. That would be wrong. And you need to watch out for that. If people entice you, people try to get you to do something that's wrong, don't listen to them and don't do it. We'll turn to Proverbs chapter 3 real quick. Verse number 1, Proverbs 3, says, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Again, it's like this basically the same promise as honoring your father and mother. You get length of days, long life, peace shall they add to thee because it's going to give you wisdom. If you forget not the law of your parents, as we were saying, don't forget my law. Don't let these things go out of your heart. Remember when mom and dad tell you things. Remember when mom and dad instruct you and tell you to be good and tell you to pay attention in church and tell you to listen to what's being preached because it's going to help you. It's going to help you for the rest of your life. Don't be forgetful. Listen to these things. Hear them and receive them. It says, let thine heart keep my commandments. Keep them in your heart. Don't let them depart from you. Verse number 11 of chapter 3 says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. Now here we see the Bible saying, look, if you're a child, and then again, this, this obviously applies to not just children. You know, don't despise the chastening of the Lord. The Lord's going to rebuke and chasten every son whom he receiveth. So if you're born again today, if you're spiritually born into God's family, you're a child of God, and God is going to treat you as a child the same way that I treat my children, they get disciplined, they get spankings, they get corrections when they when they you know break the laws and break the rules. It's the same way with God. Now, children, when you get punished, when you get disciplined, when you get a spanking, don't despise that. Despise means don't hate that. That shouldn't make you angry. And don't be weary of it. Don't don't um, don't let it bother you so much because the Bible says, "For whom the Lord loveth, He correcteth." even as a father, the son, in whom he delighteth. The reason why you receive correction is because your parents love you and they're trying to teach you what's right. And sometimes you need to get that stinging on your rear end by getting a spanking to help teach you not to do that anymore because you may not realize it at this time in your life. You might not understand it, but it's for your own good. It's something that's going to help you down the road in the future when you start growing up and you start making more decisions on your own, this correction that you receive when you're young is going to help you. Now, if you're a son of God, you receive chastening of the Lord. Again, apply that to yourself. Don't despise the chastening of the Lord. When bad things come upon you, especially because you do something that's wrong, especially because you're sinning, especially because you, know, you are in the wrong, you know you're sinning, and God's punishment comes upon you, hey, you should actually be thankful for that. Don't treat it as like a bad thing. Don't let it get you down. Don't let it get you depressed. Be glad that God is it loves you enough to correct you and to teach you right from wrong. And that he's trying to show you. He's trying to get your attention. It says a father, you know, even as a father, the son in whom he delighted. When a father delights in his son, he's going to correct him. Because he loves him. He loves him that much that he's willing to correct him. And it's you know similar to what I was saying in my sermon this morning that you know when the <clears throat> the, the, pa the pastor is trying to, to teach you about sins and trying to, to help you out and trying to correct you on some things maybe there maybe there are problems in your life hey look don't despise that don't despise that preaching don't despise the chastening of the Lord because it's all there for your benefits there to try to help you turn to chapter five if you would of Proverbs chapter five and verse number one. Again, it says, My son, attend unto my wisdom, and bow thine ear to my understanding. Now, as children get older, 
they have this tendency to think that they know everything. And the reason why I know this is because I was a child and I knew everything. And everybody in those teenage years, right around that time, you think you know everything. You think you're so smart because you've grown past this stage where you're no longer a little child. And you think, and, and in your zeal to want to become an adult, and just you want to be just like all the other adults, and you just think that you know everything, and you're so smart, and you know everything, you don't. You don't know everything. And teenagers are the worst at this, but it can go on and on, even, I mean, even in your 20s, hey look, you still don't know everything. There is a lot of wisdom that is gained through time, through experience, through a lot of study, through a lot of learning. You need to respect the people that are older, especially your parents. Your parents, even today, I'm 36 years old, my parents have a lot more, have a lot of wisdom that they can still impart unto me because they've been around on this earth for a lot longer than I have. Okay? They've experienced a lot more. Now, it doesn't mean that they're smarter than me in every aspect. But there are still things that I can gain knowledge from them. Anyone that's been around for a long time or talk to some old timers for a little while. Get to know them. Talk to people who have been on this earth for a long time. Not all of them are wise, but many of them are. Many of them have learned some things just from being alive on this earth for so long and just picking up things as you go. And it's important for a child to bow thine ear to my understanding. Bow means you have to lower a little bit. And I think with that, why that wording is put in there bowing your ear means you have to humble yourself a little bit. You have to understand that you don't know everything. You don't know what's best for you. Your parents know a lot more than you do. Whether you think so or not, it's really important to understand that, that you can bow your ear to their understanding and attend under your parents' wisdom. Your parents have been around for a lot longer than you. Especially if you're a younger child, if you're under the age of 20 especially, look, your parents have been around and have learned a lot of extremely important lessons. They've already gone through what you're going through. They've already experienced that part of their life and have learned the outcome of the decisions that are made that, are, that you can make early on in your life. And you need to listen to them and listen closely and, and respect that wisdom. If you want to be a godly child, don't let this go in one ear and out the other. Don't forget it. Listen closely. Pay respect to the knowledge that your parents have. You may think that they're dumb and they don't know anything, but you're wrong. You're wrong. They know a lot more than you do. Proverbs 10, look at verse number 5. The Bible says, He that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepest in harvest is a son that causeth shame. And again, this might be talking about people who are a little bit older than the, than the three and four year olds, right? But it's saying, look, basically, don't be lazy. I know you're a child. You don't necessarily have all the responsibilities of an adult. You don't have to go out to work and do all this stuff. But you don't want to turn into a lazy person. You don't want to be a son that says that sleeps in the harvest, right? The harvest time is typically a time, or is not typically, it is a time when the crops are ready to be reaped, when everything's there, and it's a time of hard work, okay? All throughout history, up until, up until very modern history, um, agriculture has been way different. It's, it's been um, distributed more, um, or a lot more common people did a lot more farming and a lot more raising their own crops and stuff. And it was basically the responsibility of the families to go out and do this. So it would be a farming family. Hey. Everybody pitches in. All the children work. Everybody helps out and, go, and goes and does the work. And it says that he that gathereth in the summer is a wise son. And you go out, hey, it's summertime. It may be hot. You have to get up early. You have to work late. You're using all the hours of the day. You're putting in some hard work. It says you're wise when you gather in the summer. It says, but he that sleepeth in the harvest is a son that causes shame. Isn't it going to cause shame to your parents? When you're lazy, you're just sleeping around, you're lounging around, you're not doing anything, and, and just being lazy, hey, that's going to cause shame. You need to be a hard worker. You need to learn when you're young to be a hard worker. And that's going to help you just, just excel and grow in your life. Don't be lazy. You do not want to have to fight the sin of laziness in your life. You want to start off 
being a hard worker, you'll get a lot more done in your life if you just learn how to get up and do a lot of work and do a lot of hard work. Now, here's going to be the hard part for children as they get older. One of the hard parts is that when, you're, when, when are your parents no longer your authority? See, we live in a day-to-day -day where people think, or kids think, I turn 18, my parents can't tell me what to do. They're, they're basically, they have no more authority over there. I'm 18 years old. You know, it's just this magic event happens where one day, the day before your birthday, you're 17 years old, you're under, you're under your parents' rules. You're under your parents' authority. And then they just think that, boom, you get your 18th birthday, and now it's just like the shackles are loose. You have no authority over me, Mom and Dad. And that's just completely made up. There is no significance to 18. It's not, it is not a time where, and not in God's eyes at least, okay? That may be in our government's eyes. That may be in other people's eyes. But in God's eyes, when you're at home, when you're living under your parents' roof, I'll tell you what, in my eyes too, I don't care if you're 23 years old. If you're living in my house and you're my child, you're under my authority and you're under my rules. Until you leave this house and you go off on your own, then you're no longer under my authority. But as long as you're in this house, you're under my authority, you're under the authority of the parents. And look, if there's any children listening to this that are, that are getting up there, you have to understand that you are under the authority of your parents as long as you're in their house. And the Bible says in Genesis 2.24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Not only are you under their authority, I believe that you ought to stay under their authority. That you shouldn't just go and move out. You shouldn't just go and get an apartment by yourself. I believe if you're a child, hey look, stay under your mother and father's authority until you go out and find a wife. Until you go out and get married. Then you start your own family. Then you have your own house. Then you have your own responsibilities. And then you become in charge of that household. But until then, by and large, you should be just staying at home Stick with mom and dad, you know, be under their authority, and then go out and start your own family. That would be an ideal situation in the Bible, you know, according to the Bible here. Now, as an adult, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, 1 Timothy chapter 5 says, um, stay in Proverbs. We're going to come right back to Proverbs. 1 Timothy 5 3 says, Honor widows that are widows indeed. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to, and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. So, of course, this is talking about the church taking care of widows, but it's saying, look, if you have a widow and they have children, hey, their children are supposed to be taking care of them. And children, this is your job, right? You have parents that are, that are older, especially, I mean, especially in my age group, right, and a little bit older. We have parents. They're getting a little bit older. They're getting up there in years. They may, you know, you might have one of your parents pass away that leaves, you know, maybe your mother is left as a widow. Hey, take care of her. Take care of your parents. They took care. They raised you. They brought you up from a child. They fed you. They clothed you. They did all these things for you. And guess what? When it comes time, when they are older, when they have needs, children, it's your responsibility to take care of them. It's your responsibility when dad dies to take care of your mother. Don't let her go, go off into some home somewhere. Take care of them. The Bible says in Exodus 20, 12, in the Ten Commandments, Honor thy father and thy mother, that, in thy, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And again, I'm not going to go too much into details because I preached an entire sermon on this one commandment on honoring your father and your mother. But as children, no matter what age group you are, I believe you ought to honor your father and your mother. I believe that's something that we ought to do. You ought to be able to show respect in them. And not only that, you know, I kind of went into that sermon. Honoring also has to do with you know, taking care of them financially. You know, when they come into hard times, when something happens to them, you, know, you ought to be there and capable, if you're capable, able to, to take care of them you know, and band together. They're your family, right? They're your parents. They, you, you came from them. You ought to be able to, uh, to honor them and to respect them and, and to always treat them with respect. Even if they're completely wrong on some things, hey, look, it's a picture. A lot of this is a picture of between God being your father and you being a child, a son of God. Our parents, you know, it's, it's, it's symbolic, but, it, but we also need to have that type of relationship with our parents to where we're giving them respect. 
make sure you're a godly example that that the you know the, the picture will um, lines up with the way that we are with God. Now let's I'm gonna shift gears a little bit to raising children. That had more to do with with the children themselves, especially younger children. You know things that you need to pay attention to. You need to obey your parents. You need to listen to the laws, listen to the commandments, listen to those things. Take heed to them. Understand that your parents know a lot more than you. They've been around a lot longer than you have. And you might not even understand it if you haven't been around very long. But they learn so much more than you. Take heed to what your parents tell you. But raising children, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. If you're in Proverbs, turn to Proverbs 29. But 2 Corinthians chapter 12 says, Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you. And I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. So as parents, your job in the family is to lay up for your children. You need to be able to, you know, don't rely on your children taking care of you. Don't rely on that. You need to take it upon yourself to be responsible, to be able to say, you know what? I'm going to lay up inheritance for them. We're going to work hard. I'm going to work hard and make sure that they're taken care of even after I'm gone. I'm going to do my best to work as hard. Yes, I'm going to do my best to make sure that they have what they need right now as they're growing in my house, but I'm also going to make sure that I can work as hard as I can to make sure that I can give them the best shot and take care of them as much as possible so that even after I'm gone, they can receive some kind of benefit that I can lay out for them and that they can just give them an extra boost and give them a little bit of extra help so that I've done all that I can do as a parent. And parents... A lot of times that's what you have to do. You have to be dedicated to your children and to raising them and to make sure that you've done all that you can do to give them a better start. I'm so excited to have children that I had children after I've already been saved and after I've already learned a lot about the Bible. I did not have the head start that they're getting. And it's actually really exciting to be in this position as a, as a father, as a parent of children, to try to raise them up and give them all of the benefit of knowing God's Word and knowing the Bible and, and having a lot more wisdom. So when they grow up and they're confronted with situations and they have to make decisions, hopefully, Lord willing, if we do our jobs right, we can instill, we can edify our children, we can teach them enough to be able to withstand the devil, withstand the attacks, and, and be able to make good, wise decisions that are going to be godly decisions that will help them for the rest of their life so that they don't have to fall into the same traps and the same sins that their parents fell into. And as parents, you ought to have that kind of a goal. Whatever, Wherever your children are at, whenever you've gotten saved, whenever you've come to these realizations, look, wherever you're at, do that and make that a priority to where you're going to try to do your best to help your children out to grow up to be the best children that they can. The Bible says in uh, 1 Timothy 3, 4, Again, talking about the attribute, the requirements for a pastor says one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. It is extremely important that your children are subject unto you. Your children ought not to be running all over you and running the house and just getting their way, just whatever they want. If they start crying, if they start screaming, oh yeah, just get that child shut up, just give them whatever they want. Because then what they're doing is they just have become in charge. They just have, have decided, hey, if I want this, I know what buttons to push, and I'm just going to get what I want. Your house, your house ought not to be run that way. They need to be subject unto you, fathers especially, but parents. I mean, children are supposed to be subject unto the mother and unto the father. And this will go into a little bit, um, you know, with wives. Don't rely on the husband to always be the, 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 the bad guy, quote unquote, the guy that's going to enforce the discipline and enforce the rules. Mothers should be doing the exact same thing. And, and flip-flop. Fathers also. Don't always rely on your wife. Don't always rely on her to be the one that's inflicting the discipline and doing the punishment. Hey, you need to make sure that it's clear that you are the head of the household, that you are the boss, and that you make the rules. And, you know, it's kind of a two-way street in that regard because the children are supposed to obey both of their parents. They're supposed to respect both of them. And a lot of times... The way that they get that respect and they get a proper fear is when, is when you give them the proper discipline. So we're going to move on to discipline here in Proverbs 29. Look at verse number 17. The Bible says, Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. So correcting your child 
It is obviously a very good thing to do. It says, you correct your son, and he shall give thee rest. You're not going to be worried about it. If you correct your, your son, you're not going to have to end up being worried about him. You're going to have to be, be stressing and fretting whether or not they're going to do what's right. He says, he's going to give you rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. Basically, it means if you correct, if you correct your children, they're going to turn out right. They're going to give you delight unto your soul. You're not going to be ashamed of them. You're not, they're not going to grow up to be monsters. But you have to correct them. Flip back to chapter 13 of Proverbs. Proverbs 13, verse 24. The Bible says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son. But he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Now, now parents, this is, this is a very strong wording in the Bible. The Bible says, If you spare your rod, if you hold back, if you withhold that correction that you know that they ought to get, you withhold the rod because you're lazy or because I just don't feel like doing it or whatever the reason may be or because, well, they started crying and now I don't, I don't want to give them the right discipline that they need. He says, if you spare your rod, you hate your son. That's what the Bible, those are strong words. Keep that in mind. You spare your rod when you know that they need discipline, you just don't do it for whatever reason. It doesn't even matter what the reason is, regardless. When, they, when you know they need it, now, I'm not saying if they don't need it, you spare your rod. Look, if they don't need it, they don't need it. But when you spare the rod because, and you know that they need it, for whatever the reason is, it says you hate your son. It says, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. And betimes means early. Children need to be chastened. They need to be disciplined early. They need to start young. You don't want them to start getting too old before you start disciplining them. You need to get them on the right path, you know, if the, when, when you start going down the wrong path, the farther you go, the farther away you are from the right way. It's going to take a lot more work to get them back on the right path. But as they start veering off from the right way, you correct that. You get them right back on. It's going to be a lot easier. It's a lot, it's a lot more effective. It's a lot easier to do. Um, you don't want them getting way far down. And they're, they're way over here, and they should be over here. It's going to take a long time. It's going to be a lot harder work to get them back over here. You nip that thing in the bud, you get it right away and, and get them right back on the straight and narrow. Um, and you need to do that through the proper disciplining. And here it's talking about the rod and sparing your rod. Look at Proverbs 19, verse 18. The Bible says, Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. Again, this is what I was talking about, while there's hope. You need to do it early. You need to get started early on because if you let things go too long, if you don't do the discipline, if you don't do the chastening when they need it early on, hey, you can, you can get to a point where there's no hope anymore. I mean, I, don't hear, I hear it all the time, you know, parents whose children are already grown and they're out of the house. And they're, you know, ashamed or they're embarrassed. Oh, man, I can't, I can't believe my kid did this and did that. It's like, well... You have no more hope anymore. You, you had your opportunity to raise them right and you failed. You didn't do it right. If you didn't, don't like the decision that they're making, the choices that they're doing, you should have had a lot more influence earlier on when you had hope. And then it says here, let not thy soul spare for his crying. Look, when you discipline your child, they're going to cry. <laughs> That's going to happen. No matter if, you're, if they're not, then you're not doing it right. When you discipline your child, they're going to cry. But you can't let your soul spare just because they're crying. Now look, is it a pleasant event? No. I don't, I don't know anybody personally that would say, yep, I absolutely just love just, just inflicting discipline on, on my children. It's just, that's actually the highlight of my day. You know, when I come home from work, I just look forward to just getting, getting that spanking stick out and making sure that those girls... No. Nobody likes it. Nobody wants to do it. And in fact, that's the reason why so many kids aren't disciplined properly is because you don't want to do it. It's not a fun thing. I mean, you don't want to see your kids cry. It's natural instinct. You love your children. You don't want to see them cry. But sometimes it's needful. I mean, it's the same way. You can think of, like, hey, sometimes I don't want to talk about hell. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to think about the fact that there are people literally being tortured and tormented to something you can't even imagine just, just burning and engulfed in flames. It's not fun to think about. I don't like it. I don't like to think about maybe some of my relatives going to that place. It's not comforting. It kind of makes a sick feeling in my stomach. It's not pleasant. 
but it's needful to talk about those things. It's needful to bring it up. It's needful for people to know about them the same way that it's needful for your children to receive the correction, even though they're crying, even though it's not pleasant for the moment. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, 15, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. The whole point, you're trying to drive away that foolishness. The rod of correction will do that for you. Proverbs 22, 13 says, Withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Say, look, you're not going to kill your son by giving him a spanking. Okay? That's why you don't spare for their crying. Okay? You're not going to, you know, the, the point isn't to injure them and to, and, and to, and to you know, make them bloody or black loose. Them. That's not it at all. That if you're doing that, you're definitely doing it wrong. Okay? It's correction. You beat them with the rod. It says, look, they're not going to die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. I just brought up that reference to hell. I did that on purpose because the Bible's talking about, look, when you beat your, your children with the rod, when you spank them, when you give them the proper discipline, that's going to help them to, be, to deliver their soul from hell. When children grow up, and they don't understand that there's, there's negative consequences for their actions, physical consequences that actually hurt. Not just getting a lecture, not just, just sitting in time out or having some toys taken away from them. I mean, they experience a little bit of pain. They feel it. They know, hey, when I disobey, when I do something that's wrong, I'm going to feel that sting, and that is not a pleasant feeling. That's not good. Well, there is, God has a punishment for us, for our sins. And His punishment stings. Our sins, that punishment is hell. It's that lake of fire where you're going to be burning and tortured and tormented forever. That is the punishment that God has for your sins. Thank God for His forgiveness. Thank God for Jesus Christ paying for that sin. But look, when you understand as a young child, you get it through your head that your consequences, that you're acting bad, you're disobeying is going to result in a physical bad consequence that hurts, that doesn't feel good. Hey, they're going to have a lot better understanding and it's going to be a lot easier for them to receive and understand the fact that God has a punishment that's called hell. A lot of people these days, they don't even believe in hell. I don't know how many people I talk to, especially in Phoenix, people say, oh, we're in hell right now. It's like 100 degrees outside. It's like, this isn't even close. Not even close. But they just don't believe it. And I think a lot, and especially with the younger generation, you know, we have the divorced parents. We have the homes that are broken up. And now the parents, they want to be, you know, they want to win over their child's affection. So they won't discipline them properly because they're afraid that their child's not going to love them. And they want to be in competition with the other spouse that they're divorced from. And, and they're going to be, you know, fighting to buy more gifts and more presents just so that their child will love them more. And they're ruining and destroying their children's lives. Nothing good comes out of the divorces. Nothing. It's a destroying and tearing down of the family. The children need to understand, and especially in this day, there's so many children being raised by single parents. And so many of them are not doing the proper discipline. Part of it is because if you're a single parent, you don't even get to spend that much time with your child because you have to go off and work and support your, yourself and your child while they're just going off to of school or whatever. You don't get that much time around them to give them the proper discipline. In order to give them discipline, hey, you need to be there when they're doing something wrong. You need to be able to see it. You need to be able to correct that. They're not going to get that type of discipline at school. They're not going to get that type of discipline at daycare. That has to come from the parents. And I wouldn't want anyone at daycare spanking my children for me. I don't know them. They don't know my children. They don't love them the way I love them. I don't know what they're going to do. They might be masochistic. They might be doing some things. They might injure them. It's not their child. Or they might not do it properly. I don't know. I'm not going to trust them. I'm not going to trust anybody else raising or rearing or disciplining my children than myself and my wife. It's our responsibility as parents to do that. Proverbs 29, 15 says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Again, a child left to himself. It's a mother's job. 
to watch and pay attention and know what their child is doing. Give them the proper discipline. Give them the rod. Give them the reproof. Explain it to them. Don't just, don't just give them the spanking. Give them the reproof. Tell them that what they're doing is wrong. And that gives them wisdom. They're going to learn from that. Now, that may be the hard way of learning, but they're going to learn from it. And that's why the parents who have been, you know, why it's so important for the children to listen to their parents. The parents have been around for a long, a long time. And some of us had to learn things the hard way. And it's taken a lot of time to learn it, but we've still learned it. It's still, it's still something that we know and it's something that we're going to be able to pass on to you. But you need to listen. You need to hear it, child. You need to, to listen to your parents and learn from their successes, learn from their failures, learn as much as you can from what they've done. Your parents know a lot more what's better for you than you do. The same way that God knows way more what's best for us than we do. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter number 12. Hebrews chapter number 12, because as, I, as we, we went over earlier, you know, we get chastened also as God's children. As a child of God, you know, he's going to discipline us. And we need to understand that as well. The same way that a loving father is going to discipline his children and try to teach them right from wrong, deliver their soul from hell by not sparing the rod, God's going to do the same thing for us, okay? It's not just for our young little ones. We're a young little one in God's eyes, and we're going to receive the same type of chastening. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, verse 6, it says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Again, proving that, you know, the loving parent is the one that's going to discipline their children. They're the ones that love them. It says, and scourgeth. Scourgeth means whip, okay? Scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. And you say, well, that doesn't sound very pleasant, right? That doesn't sound very good to be a child of God, then, if he's going to chasten it and scourge it every son whom he receiveth. But it is. It's loving. It says he loveth them. But it's talking about you getting whipped. That's not pleasant. It's not good. It's not fun for the temporary, for the, for the moment, for the time being, but it's good for the long run. Verse 7 says, if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons, for what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? If you don't chasten your children, what type of a father are you? That's what the Bible's saying. Verse number eight. But if ye be without chastisement, that means if you're not getting any discipline from God, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. The Bible's making it really clear here. Look, if you're a child of God, if you're a son of God, he is going to discipline you. It's going to happen because you're not perfect. And he loves you and he's going to correct you and try to show you what's right. He will correct you. He will bring the discipline and say, if you never get any discipline from God in your entire life, you better watch out and think, am I a bastard and not even a son? Because the Bible says that God loves me and if he loves me, he's going to correct me. And if I got zero correction from God, I would be checking my own salvation. Am I even a son of God? Am I a child of God? Bible says in verse 9, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? Say, look, you obeyed your parents. They, they corrected you. They spanked you. They disciplined you. And you, you gave them reverence. You respected them. Basically, how much more should we be in subjection unto God? Because we know that he's going to scourge, scourge with us. If he hasn't already, if he hasn't chastened you, it's coming. He's going to do it. It says in verse 10, For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. We receive correction from God. We did receive this chastening for our own benefit, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Holiness means being separated. So he could separate us from our sin and to help us not to sin anymore. That's why, so we could be partakers of his holiness. It says in verse 11, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Of course, it's never fun going through the disciplining. It says, Nevertheless, afterward it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. See, inflicting a punishment and chastisement on your children, it's going to require a little bit of faith. 
You have to understand that first it's grievous. First, it's not going to be pleasant. You have to do it though, because it's later it's going to yield the peaceable fruit. Later, you're going to see, wow, I'm really glad that I disciplined my children early and, and stuck with it and didn't get lazy and I made sure that they received the proper correction that they needed because it's going to be really important later on. You're going to see, I mean, you already can see today these kids that are monsters, that grow up with no discipline, that throw themselves down in a grocery store and they're throwing a screaming, raging fit and they might even be up to like 10 years old or whatever and they just have no regard, no respect for anyone around them, no respect for their parents and the parents are saying, come on, come on Johnny, let's go, come on, you know, like, all right, all right, all right, I'll buy that for you, come on, just stop crying, let's go, you're making a scene, let's go. No proper discipline, no correction. They're just going to grow up. They're going to have the same spoiled brat attitude. They're going to think that the world owes them something because they've been receiving all this stuff from their parents, getting no type of discipline, nothing to let them know that their behavior is wrong and that's not the way that you're supposed to be acting. That's not the way you behave. They turn into monsters. And, and if you get to a point where there's no hope for that person, where they're just, I mean, they've been ruined. They haven't received the discipline that they need. Now, um, raising children, though, that we spent quite a bit of time on, on the disciplining portion of it, which is very important. But raising children, raising guys with children is a lot more than just the discipline part. It's a lot more than just inflicting a spanking. You can spank your kids appropriately and still not have them turn out right. Because raising your children is more than just a dis discipline. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter number 6. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Train up. Train up is not, it's not saying anything about disciplining or chastening them there. It's training them. You're teaching them. You're training them. Training up a child requires a lot of work. It requires a lot of effort. It requires a lot of teaching. They need to be read the Bible. They need to understand the truth. It's more than just correcting them when they do wrong. It's teaching them. It's, in, it's, it's talking with them. It's spending time with them and helping them understand and giving them the, 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 the best start that they can because you're imparting wisdom unto them. You're teaching them. You're training them. I mean, training a lot of times is going to be repetitive. You're going to be going over the same stuff over and over and over again. And it might be boring to you because you already know this stuff. But it's important for your children. Just keep doing it. Stay steadfast. Train. Just, just day after day after day. If you have to hammer it into their heads, that's going to be important because if you train up a child in the way he should go, again, don't be so focused about all the things that they should be doing. Train them in the way that he should go. Discipline them when they're going the wrong way, but train them in the way that they should go. Teach them this is what you should be doing. This is going to help you. This is the way you ought to be going. Train him the way he should go, and when he's old, he's not going to depart from it. If you do your job right, if you train him up right, they will be good then throughout their adult life as well. Deuteronomy chapter 6, look at verse number 4. The Bible reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words, which I command thee this day, shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. This is how important the word of God is, the words that he's commanded unto us. We need to make sure. Look, this is like every aspect of your day, you're thinking about that. Teach them diligently unto your children. Not just every once in a while. Not just when it's convenient. Not just, oh, when I have time, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll crack open the Bible and, and maybe we'll go through a verse or two. Diligently. Diligently means you're doing it regularly. You're putting forth a lot of effort. You're making sure that this is going to be done because... This is important. With my children, I don't care nearly as much about the other things that they learn. We need to make sure it's a priority. They're going to learn the Bible. They're going to learn God's Word first. 
It's a priority. Now, I want them to learn all the stuff. I don't want my children being uneducated. They're going to learn as much as is possible. But we're going to be diligent about it. And we're going to make sure that they are learning what they need to learn. And these words, it says, teach them diligently to the children. Talk of them when thou sittest in thy house. So when you're at home, do you talk about the Bible? How about when thou walkest by the way? How about when you're out on the road? How about when you're out driving somewhere? Do you talk about the Bible? How about when thou liest down? When you're ready to go to bed, do you talk about the Bible? How about when thou risest up? Are you talking about God's commandments? Are you talking about what, what the things that are of God, the things that are in the Bible? Are you talking about this stuff? Bind them for a sign upon thine hand. He's saying, look, write them on your hands. They should be as frontlets between thine eyes. Like, everywhere you look, he's saying, you know, you should, you should have the Bible. You should have God's word in your heart. You should be talking about it when you lay down, when you rise up, when you sit down to eat, when you go by the way, when you're walking, when, you're, when you, you know, teach it to your children. It's so important. God's word has life. God's word is, I mean, Jesus Christ said, he wasn't going to say, he was that, you know, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. God's word is so critical for our lives to be successful in our life and to raise successful children. Now, I'm going to close with this. Finally, children are a blessing. Turn to Psalm 127, the last place we're going to turn. Psalm 127. There's so many things that are backwards to say. People look at children, they look at children oftentimes as a burden. People look today. Oftentimes just say, you know what, these kids are just, it's just a bunch of work. It's all it is. And, and they, just, they just have this bad attitude about children, or they'll say, well, you don't want to have too many. You just want to maybe have one or two, and that's it. And we're just going to have one or two, and that's it. Look at Psalm 127. Look at verse number 3. The Bible says, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Having children is a reward. It's a good thing. It's a very positive thing all throughout the Bible. It's very positive. You're blessed if you have children. How they bless Rachel, that she would be the mother of, of millions, basically. She was just going to be a mother with lots of children. You are blessed when you have children. The fruit of the, of the womb is God's reward. It's a reward unto you to have children. It says, as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Don't wait around to have kids. Don't, don't put off this plan and say, well, you know, we're married, we're young, but we're going to wait, you know, five years. I'm going to go to college or I'm going to do this and we're going to do all these other things. We're going to travel. I'm going to get all this stuff that I want to have taken care of for me and then I'm going to have kids. Don't do that. Don't have that kind of a selfish attitude. Just say, look, if you could trust God and His Word, if you could trust that children are a reward, don't do all this family planning. The Bible says, happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Look, children are a blessing. And, and like I was just saying, if you're married, if you have no kids, don't get caught up in the worldly philosophies of this family planning stuff where we're going to say, okay, well, we don't have enough money, we can't afford whatever. Look, God's the one that opens and closes the womb. God's the one that knows if you're going to be able to handle having children, how many children you can handle. God's not going to put you through anything and, and give you something that you're not capable of handling yourself. You think, I don't know, I, I, there's no way I can handle having like eight children. It'd just be crazy. It'd just be way too much work. I don't even think I could ever do it. Well, look, God knows if you can do it or not. And I'll tell you this much, if you can't do it, if, if you are just, if this is something that is unable for you to do, God will not let you go through it. And God is the one that opens the womb. God's the one that closes the womb. I'm not going to prove it tonight. It's outside of the scope of the sermon. But you can prove that very easily all throughout the Bible. People praying to God and God answering the prayer and opening up the womb. And God also, as a punishment or whatever, closing up the womb of some people. God does that. God has control over that. And don't forget the story of Onan. Onan was the one, is the, the only example of, of birth control in the entire Bible was a man named Onan. Only event, the only time it's ever recorded where there's somebody practicing birth control and God killed him for it. God struck him dead. Now, you might argue about why God killed him, but look, that is the one example we have of birth control in the Bible. That's it. 
The world's going to tell you all their reasoning and all their philosophy and all the reasons why you shouldn't have kids. The Bible tells you that having children is a blessing. Having children is a good thing. Hey, happy is the man that has quiver full of them. It's a good thing. God knows what's... Look, it's a, the fruit of the room is his reward. And then... <laughs> The, the family planning is one thing, but then you got people just, just killing their children and, and, and aborting them. And, and they use these terms, you know, abortion, as if you're, you know, I mean, it's it, it just desensitizing the fact that you're murdering the child that's in your womb. And this is the sick, twisted society that we live in. It's been going on all throughout history. The Bible talks about people who passed their children through the fire that killed their children, okay? It's completely backwards. God gives you a reward, the fruit of the womb. Here's a child, and you're going to go and just, and just destroy that. It's disgusting. It's sick. Keep that in mind, too, parents. Your children are a blessing for you. They're a reward. It's not always easy raising them. It, sometimes it can be difficult. It can be challenging, you know, you have so much work to do. You have all this stuff that you got to take care of, especially the wife. You know, I have all these. You know, the wife has all these roles. They have responsibilities to keep the house. They have to teach their children. You have to do all these things. It's a lot of hard work. But don't faint. Don't lose sight of the fact that you are doing an extreme. Don't ever. Don't ever think, women. Don't ever think, mothers. Don't ever think that your job is not that important. Not for one second. The most important job you have is raising these children. Raising your children. That is by far the way that they grow up, you have such an influence on their life. They're not just some burden. They're, they're, they're people that you ought to love, obviously. I mean, they're your kids. But, but invest the time that they need. Invest the time in the proper discipline and invest the time in the proper training and teaching of, of God's word and just of other truths and, and things that they need to know to make them successful in their life. And children, the, the main thing that you have to remember that the Bible teaches for your role in the family, obey your parents. Listen to what they say. The Bible says that God is pleased. God will be happy with you when you obey what your mom and dad say. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for giving us so much information on how the family ought to, to run and, and ought to function and, and the authority structure, dear God. Um, you lay it out for us clearly. A lot of people don't want to hear it or take heed to, to what you've told us and, and just the basic truth that you've given us, dear Lord. Um, I pray that, that if there's some things that we don't already know from experience that we don't have to, to learn them through experience, but we can just trust your word and take it by faith that what you're saying is right and true and that this is the best way that we can be raising our children and having our family in order for the role of the husbands, the role of the wives, and the children's role, dear God. I pray that you would please just, just help us to have the faith to understand that that you know what 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 authority structure within and the way that you designed the family help us individually to meet the um, what you've laid out for us in, in, in each of our various roles dear God I pray that you would please help us as parents to be the best parents that we can be to train our children up right not to be slack in the discipline dear God I pray that you please help us as husbands to be the best leaders that we can be to, to make the right decisions for our family and dear God I pray for the wives that you would help them to be um, in their, their proper submissive role, but also to be very hard workers and to get all the work done that you've assigned unto them in, in running the household, essentially, and, and, and being responsible for raising the children. Dear God, I pray that you would please just, just help us all to not be influenced by this world and the world's distorted, twisted, perverted views on how a family should, be, should function, dear God. But I pray that you would please just, just help us to follow your word as closely as possible. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.